The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 8301 in the name of Joanne Lamont on St Andrews First Aid. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put with those members who wish to speak in the debate. Please press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Joanne Lamont to open the debate. Ms Lamont, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking colleagues from across, across the Chamber for the very significant level of support for this motion and for attending tonight's debate. I would also like to thank St Andrew's First Aid, the British Heart Foundation and all those other organisations and volunteers who day and daily bring first aid to our communities, allowing events to take place and giving support to um, a range of groups right across our communities. This motion was submitted following the publication of the Scottish OHCA Data Linkage Project, which looked into survival rates from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in Scotland. And it sounds like a dry report, but it speaks volumes about inequality in Scotland. The report, which was delivered jointly by the University of Edinburgh and the Scottish Government, and supported by the Scottish Ambulance Service and National Service of Scotland, found that survival rates in Scotland following out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are estimated between just 6 and 8%. With the European average sitting at 10.2%, this figure puts Scotland among European countries with the lowest survival rates. The findings of the report added further weight to the continued efforts of St Andrew's First Aid to ensure people across Scotland are equipped with vital life-saving first aid skills. The first paragraph of the report reveals the scale of the problem here in Scotland. Around 3,000 patients each year will have resuscitation attempted after a sudden cardiac arrest in the community. But only around 6% will survive to hospital discharge. In the best of performing comparable settings around the world, survival is as high as 25%. The report has identified a number of factors which indicate a very real link between areas of social deprivation and a person's chances of surviving an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, which can affect people of all ages at any time. The report revealed that those living in the most deprived areas of the country were twice as likely to suffer uh, an OHCA as people living in more affluent areas, 28% against 14%. Furthermore, those from the most deprived areas were 43% less likely to survive a cardiac arrest than those from more affluent areas. Other factors identified in the report were the average age of OHCA victims in areas of deprivation is seven years lower. Bystander CPR was attempted in just 40% of cases recorded by the Scottish Ambulance Service before they arrived. This is lower than in some parts of England. For example, in London, it is 60% of recorded cases. People from the more deprived areas are less likely, around 38%, to receive bystander CPR compared to more affluent areas at 45%. Surely, Deputy Presiding Officer, if it were mandatory for people to have even basic first aid skills, these factors could be greatly reduced. It's a simple solution. More lives could be saved if more people had the skills to help save others. St Andrew's First Aid is now calling for more to be done to reduce the statistics I have cited and increase levels of first aid skills in Scotland. Scotland. This simple approach would deliver widespread benefits, literally saving lives. There are additional benefits first aid training would bring, which I would like to highlight. Last year, a report by the British Red Cross found that first aid training could help ease the pressure on A&E departments. The report stated that over a third of people surveyed attended A&E because they were, quote, worried and didn't know what to do. People expressed a desire to use A&E services appropriately, but found it difficult to know whether a health problem was severe enough to need urgent care. A central case to this evening's debate, the report highlighted that healthcare professionals themselves state that most patients have not attempted first aid before coming to hospital. By equipping people with the proper skills and training um, more first aiders, we can begin to turn the tide on this issue. Education is paramount in addressing this problem. In one region of Glasgow, St Andrew's First Aid have been working in partnership with a number of secondary schools to improve and increase levels of first aid skills among young people. In the north of the city, almost 400 young people have been first aid trained, and in turn, these pupils will show quick case what they have learned to their fellow pupils, passing on vital skills and knowledge. 
The feedback St Andrews First Aid has received from the schools has been overwhelmingly positive, with reports that people grow in confidence and learn to use their initiative in different ways than before. This does not just apply to First Aid, but it applies to all of the studies and extracurricular activities. Although the programmes are centred around the teaching of First Aid, the skills people learn are transferable and can set them up for everything, um, taking them through school and beyond. In a year of young people and the appointment of St Andrew's First Aid as the official first aid provider for the European Championships being held in Glasgow in August, perhaps the Scottish Government can look at what opportunities may arise around encouraging young people to volunteer and take up the opportunity to learn how to save a life. Life transforming for them and life saving perhaps for others. A virtuous circle if ever there was one. The findings of the report have provided a firm starting point from which we should be urging for more to be done to improve survival rates and address the shortage of first aid skills held by individuals which could literally save lives and put to an end this most horrible example of a postcode lottery. More likely to die and less likely to be saved. It's common sense to equip people with the simple skills they need to save a life and everyone will benefit. Um, Aileen Cam Campbell, the Minister, had already agreed to meet with me and I look forward to further exploring how we make sure people from the most deprived areas have a better chance of survival and that more people are equipped with life-saving skills. This campaign by St Andrew's First Aid addresses some of the most challenging issues faced by people living in Scotland's deprived areas today and I sincerely hope that the Scottish Government will work collaboratively with St Andrew's First Aid and others so we can see Scotland become a nation of skilled first aiders. And may I say in conclusion, we all understand the massive challenge um, ongoing health inequalities present to us all. It can be overwhelming. So many causes, so many potential solutions. We ought not to be overwhelmed into inaction, however. This issue, equipping us with the skills of first aid and understanding that these skills are already unequally distributed across the population, is one part of a big picture. But is one part we can act on right now, and I seek the Minister's assurance that she understands and will act. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Lamont. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by congratulating uh, Joanne Lamont for bringing this debate to the Chamber? It also gives me a chance to thank all the volunteer first aiders who turn up at so many events that we all take for granted. I was at the Scottish Indoor Athletics Championships at the weekend and there were the first aid aiders, uh, a permanent fixture, ready trackside to pick us fragile athletes up when we break. And I want to take the opportunity today to let them know that they are noticed, their commitment is recognised, and we thank them for the service that they provide. But speaking directly to Joanne Lamont's motion, where she highlights the disparity in incidents and survival rates for cardiac arrest between deprived areas and more affluent areas, it strikes me that the place to start would be in the school classroom. I know that I learned uh, basic first aid when I was at school and as a life skill I would suggest that it's very important on so many fronts. The obvious one is that its ability to positively intervene in a medical emergency, that basic understanding of emergency procedures that can save lives as has already been highlighted by uh, Joanne Lamont. I think this is particularly pertinent uh, given the recent pressures on our A&E departments uh, and, and our primary care services. The British Red Cross survey of a &E attendees, as has been said, found that a third had attended a &E because they were worried and didn't know what to do, with health workers further saying that most patients hadn't attempted first aid before coming to hospital. And that same research found that nearly 60% of pre-hospital deaths from injury may have been prevented had first aid been carried out before the arrival of the emergency medical services. They went on to say that injury may have been prevented had first aid been carried out before their arrival at a &E. but For me, one of the most star uh, starkest revelations in that research found out that three out of four parents in the UK would not be able to save their baby from choking. If there was ever a statistic that should grab our attention, surely it's that one. And I am sure that if mothers and fathers were to be asked the question, they would overwhelmingly want to have that skill in their parenting toolkit. Now, patients seem to struggle to assess severity of health problems and, and, and I, I don't know where best to get help. Describing, it has been described, first aid has been described as, as a lost skill, and this has to have a direct impact 
on delivery of emergency services and at a time when the preventable health agenda is gaining more oxygen, it would seem to me that introducing or reintroducing basic first aid training in schools could be a significant element of that preventable health agenda. I've even spoken to schools who teach pupils to recognise the telltale signs of students struggling with conditions like hypoglycemia associated with diabetes and what they should do in those situations. And I, I believe that it can be very empowering to have that kind of skill at your disposal, that confidence to intervene when that situation arrives. I also think that having friends and fellow students around you that have an understanding of your condition through that, that education must also be a comfort as well as that idea that with the general understanding, perhaps you can tackle that pot potential feeling of isolation that the lack of understanding from your peers can bring. We hear a lot about stigma, which is born out of ignorance in many cases, and I think the potential consequence of this kind of approach could be to normalise these kinds of health-related issues. Now, the school education will in itself not tackle the disparity between the incidence of conditions like cardi cardiac arrest between the more deprived communities and those which are better off. However, it would certainly have the potential to increase survival rates no matter where these issues occur. By definition, though, given that the occurrences of these conditions are higher in the more deprived areas, the impact of universal training in schools should be felt to a greater degree in the worst affected areas, i.e. the most deprived areas. Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, can I once again thank Joanne Lammer for giving us the opportunity to speak on this topic in the Chamber and to thank those first aiders and volunteers who are all too often taken for granted. Today we have the opportunity to say to them that their contribution to our well-being is valued. And can I say perhaps it's time to look at how the opportunity to learn these life skills are brought out to the wider community. And we suggest that the place to start is the school classroom. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Whit. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by John Scott. John Scott will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to uh, begin by... Congratulating Jan Lamont on securing this debate and thank her for bringing this important issue to the Chamber. I don't think there's any of us who have not at some point in our life, either through family or friends, have even directly been touched by heart disease and potentially um, out of hospital cardiac arrest. Uh, I should declare an interest before proceeding. Um, all of my staff in my constituency office received their first aid training and their first aid certificate from St Andrews and I myself attended a course um, five years ago, um, which I found, and I think John Lamont's uh, remarks about, and I think Brian Little is as well, maybe touching this, about how enriching an experience first aid training can be. I certainly found that. Um, my only regret is that was five years ago, and I'm more than a little out of date. So I thank John Lamont for um, securing this debate in another way, because it's certainly been um, uh, reminding me of my need to go back and to uh, not only refresh, but relearn a lot of my skills. Uh, I, I think, like John Lamont, I was really quite taken aback by the numbers. Um, Jan Lamont, I know she um, represented Pollock previously, she represents Glasgow, and representing Renfrewshire South, a constituency that has very affluent areas, but also areas of some deprivation as well. I'm, I'm aware and I see firsthand on a, on a daily basis some of the gross um, health inequalities in general, um, social economic inequalities that exist. Um, I think really that when we're looking at people from the most deprived areas are 43% less likely to survive than those from the, most, from the least deprived areas. Um, that really um, is a call to action for all of us. Um, and I do commend this, the Scottish Government for um, engaging with this issue with the uh, 2015 document, the uh, strategy for Scotland, I think, to be aiming to have 500,000 people who are CPR trained is a, is a laudable aim. Um, and I think what I was particularly struck by, a very positive statistic, is that and it's contained within the 2015 strategy suggests that a defibrillatory shock to the heart within um, three to five minutes of collapse can produce survival rates as high as 75%. Now, when we're in a situation where at the moment survival rates are barely one in 20 between six and 8%, and we know um, where there's outstanding practice, say in places like Seattle, there's a 25% uh, success rate. We know that, there's a, um, the, the, that if we undertake the action to make sure more people are equipped with these um, CPR skills, then we can make a real fundamental difference. Brian Whittle spoke about um, a universal application, and I certainly think what was, 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 um, I was uh, struck by, again, in the strategy, was the example in Denmark, 
where there seems to be, with the greater uptake of CPR training, I think they had mandatory, I think it was with, um, it became a mandatory part of doing one's driving uh, license. Uh, we see actually the data suggests a direct correlation of an increase um, in CPR bystander um, interventions. Um, and of course, that is such a, a key part of the, uh, the, the chain of survival. Um, there was, again, there's another point I really want to pick up from Jan Lamont speaking about accident and emergency departments and relieving the pressure. I think any of us who have had conversations with clinicians at all levels, we, we do know about some of the challenges, for example, with the, the worried well and the unworried unwell um, and some of the kind of pressures that that can contribute. Uh, I think actually people being more empowered and equipped and confident to make decisions before going to A&E. Um, first aid training more broadly can play a, a really very significant part in that and perhaps people will have the knowledge to use perhaps intermediate steps before going to A&E, such as making an appointment with their GP or going to their pharmacist. So this is about actually empowering individuals and I think this actually also kind of relates very powerfully to the whole realistic medicine agenda, which is ultimately about empowering patients and not thinking about um, patients but as citizens. And I actually think, just to conclude, presiding officer, there's no more way to be an empowered, confident citizen than to have the skill set to deliver CPR and to save someone's life. And so I would encourage everyone in here who has, and I'm certainly going to do it myself, if you need to update your first trade training, if you need to do it, it's a great thing to do and take that message and spread it far and wide. Thank you. Thank you. I call John Scott. Mr Scott, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by congratulating Joanne Lamont on securing this debate tonight on St Andrew's First Aid. Can I also acknowledge the good work done by St Andrew's First Aid and by definition thank the First Aiders for all the good work they do, not just in my constituency of Ayr but right across Scotland. The St Andrew's First Aiders are also volunteers and they are at the front line in providing often life-saving first aid at many public events across Scotland and their presence at major events is enormously reassuring both for the public and the organisers of major public events. Our thanks too to the British Red Cross for their briefing for this debate in which they highlight that 59% of hospital deaths from injury may have been prevented had first aid been carried out before the arrival of the emergency services. And also that only 37% of people attending A&E with conditions where first aid could have helped had received any approved first aid before the arrival at an A&E unit. Further, a third of people presenting at A&E units do so because they are worried and don't know what to do. And by going to A&E can clog up the service, particularly in winter when they had no need to be there. So there is a need for us all to be better educated, as others have said, about first aid, myself included. And this was dramatically brought home to me during a Christmas Day lunch some years ago on my farm at Ballantrae when my father choked on a piece of turkey. Unable to breathe, he turned blue very quickly and none of us knew what to do apart from my daughter who got my father to the kitchen sink, performed the Heimlich manoeuvre, up and out came the turkey and Christmas Day continued without a further hiccup. That my daughter saved my father's life that Christmas Day is beyond doubt as we were 36 miles from the A&E unit at Ayr, with the nearest ambulance perhaps 20 to, 30 minute, 20 to 30 minutes away. Of course, I use my own family circumstances to illustrate the point that having first aid skills, while vitally important in an urban environment, are even more important in a rural one. And so the need for educating our children in first aid, or bluntly, survival techniques, become greater as the distance from A&E units increase. Turning now to the results of the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest data linkage project, I would congratulate the author of this report, or the authors, on the stark clarity of it and its very disturbing conclusions. It concerns us all that historically of the approximately 3,000 people in Scotland who had an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest every year, only 180 survived to hospital discharge. Bad enough, but worse still when compared against the best survival rates worldwide, where out of a similar cohort of 3,000 people, 750 survived. And so we welcome the ambitious collaborative effort launched in 2015 
and now ongoing to improve this survival rate, hopefully to 1,180 survivors out of the 300 victims of OHC annually by 2020. And perhaps we can look forward to an update from the Minister tonight on how this is going. <coughs> In the meantime, we have to confront the findings of this report to emphasise the need for improvement, because it's not acceptable that only one in 17 people who have an OHCA survive to leave hospital. It's not acceptable that those who live in rural areas have a still further reduced chance of survival 30 days after an OHCA. And it's not acceptable that people living in our most deprived areas are twice as likely to have an OHCA as those living in better off parts of our community. As Joanne Lamont said, it's not acceptable the average age of those who have an OHCA in deprived areas is seven years lower than the average age of those having an OHCA in better off areas. And this probably goes a long way towards explaining why life expectancy in the most deprived part of my ear constituency is seven years less than in the better off areas. It's not acceptable that up to the age of 85, men are much more likely to die from an OHCA than women. <coughs> and while this might be a matter of simple physiology, I certainly, as a man, would like to know the reason why this is the case, as I was unable to find an explanation in the report. Minister, perhaps you can tell us. And so, presiding officer, I again thank first aiders, wherever they are, for their selfless life-saving volunteering. I encourage the government to increase population resilience and positive OHC outcomes by supporting the delivery of education in schools, colleges, universities and later in life of first aiding techniques. And I look forward to the Minister responding to the many questions raised in this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Scott. I call on Maureen Watt, close to the government. Minister, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Joanne Larmont for the opportunity to, in this Scottish Parliament, consider how we can all be ready to save a, a life. Can I also recognise the excellent work of St Andrew's First Aid in Scotland, delivering expertise with enthusiasm. Firstly, I think we should highlight today's health figures, showing that the rate of people dying from heart disease has reduced by 40% in the past 10 years in Scotland, and the gap in inequalities has narrowed. Additionally, the rate of new cases of coronary heart disease has decreased by 27%. And I want to thank all those working across NHS Scotland and beyond to tackle heart disease and recognise the real results they're delivering. Through our out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy for Scotland, which as Minister for Public Health I launched in 2015, we aim to increase the survival rate from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Equipping people with skills to save a life is fundamental to our bold aim to save an additional 1,000 lives by 2020. Our strategy was developed and is implemented in partnerships with stakeholders already working hard to improve cardiac arrest survival, like the Blue Light Services and Health Services and voluntary organisations, including St Andrew's First Aid. We know, we all know, that it is the right action in the minutes immediately following a cardiac arrest, calling 999 and starting CPR is where we will have most gains in life saved. Bystander CPR can increase survival after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest by two or three times. Without it, survival chance drops by 10% every minute. And that's why bystander CPR is the first priority for the strategy. CPR is incredible as a life-saving saving skill that anyone can learn. Our commitment is to equip half a million people with CPR skills by 2020 and create a nation of life savers. For this, we are driving a coordinated national approach asking the people of Scotland to join us to be ready to save a life. The organisations that have come together in partnership as Save a Life for Scotland are increasing opportunities to learn CPR and raising awareness of cardiac arrest. This model is unique internationally 
and builds on existing work by services, communities and individuals. Notable achievements by Save a Life for Scotland partner organisations in spreading CPR learning are working directly with many schools across Scotland to support CPR education. Also a CPR pack of resources for schools developed uh, with Education Scotland is available from their GLOW website and many contributions tonight have urged more uh, C, uh, first aid training and CPR training in schools. And under, just let me finish this point, yeah, just let me finish this point. Under Curriculum for Excellence, schools have already the flexibility to provide emergency or first aid training and it's up to individual schools and local authorities to decide if and how best to deliver this. Fulton McGregor. I, I thank the Minister for uh, the intervention and it, and it was on that point. I wonder if she'll join with me in um, celebrating the work of uh, four nurses at Wisha uh, Emergency Department who have set up a Keep, keep to the Beat um, service, um, Caroline Michelle and the two Fionas, where they go, they're going around schools in North Lanarkshire and South Lanarkshire teaching uh, CPR to young people in some of the most deprived areas and they've just recently been recognised by the Health Board for doing that. Minister. That's excellent and I'm sure it's being replicated across the country and Joanne Lamont herself highlighted what is happening in a number of schools in Glasgow and there's also a successful social media campaign which was run by Young Scott, a CPR live stream video where young people learn CPR with a Scottish ambulance service paramedic. And that was Young Scott's most successful video to date, with over 43,000 views. Scotland's Fire and Rescue Service, opening its 350 community fire and rescue stations for use as training videos using call push rescue kits provided by British Heart Foundation is also a way of learning CPR. We're delivering CPR learning to the Scottish public in shopping centres, railway stations and leisure centres and with community groups. And I spent one uh, cold day outside uh, the museum on the mound highlighting the out-of-hospital out cardiac arrest strategy. Um, we've also... Yeah, sure. Joanne Lamont. I mean, I do understand that schools are under pressure and, and the, the, the lot of pressures on them in terms of delivering the curriculum and so on. But would you acknowledge that seeking simply volunteers to come and learn will mean that disproportionately young people in poorer communities are less likely to access that? And the most obvious vehicle is schools and what conversations might she have with her colleagues in education, education minister, to look at how we can create incentives for schools in those deprived areas to take up the opportunities to get their young people trained in first aid? Minister. Well, I wouldn't necessarily agree with the member. I think uh, Fulton McGregor highlighted that there is good work going on throughout our schools, uh, throughout our communities, and it's not necessarily the case that more deprived communities are less likely to have um, those opportunities. But I take on board uh, what the member has said. Um, we've had lots of... Um, high profile events at things like um, the Royal Highland Show, Edinburgh Military Tattoo. I think being at the Royal Highland Show can meet the, the uh, rural community and highlight to the rural community how important that is. And obviously with the European Championships that has been mentioned and the Year of Young People this year, we have opportunities to continue to promote first aid and um, out of hospital CPR. So, as well as we continue to develop our active online and social media presence as a portal for information. And Tom uh, Martha mentioned uh, communities and community groups, and I'd like to commend all the community councils and community groups who have um, provided defibrillators in their communities. And I'd also like them to make sure that they register them with the Scottish Ambulance Services so that once you dial 999, the Scottish Ambulance Service can tell you where the nearest defibrillator, defibrillator is. To date, the Save a, Save a Life for Scotland partners have equipped already 200,000 people with CPR skills. And having launched the campaign in 2015, I'm particularly proud of this. And I want to thank all the partners and people involved, including, as I said, St Andrew's First Aid for, uh, for this achievement. 
To achieve this, we have listened, used evidence, and made learning CPR easy, accessible, and free. We have distilled down the key requirements so CPR can be learned in a short time. We know that survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is worst in more deprived areas, and one reason is lower rates of CPR. We are seeking to narrow this gap and save a life for Scotland partners are proactively working in these communities. For maximum effect, Save a Life work through organisations already established and incredible is key. For example, the successful CPR week in North Edinburgh, where with the excellent essential contribution of community shop volunteers, over 200 people in the community took time to learn CPR. Building on the Save a Life are in active discussion on CPR learning with some of the least well-off communities in Dundee and Glasgow. A higher incidence of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is a result of broader population health patterns related to deprivation. And as this, house, this chamber will know, we're taking action on this, supporting people to live healthier lives with our tobacco policies, alcohol framework, and diet and obesity consultation. Health inequalities are a reflection of wider social inequalities and one of our biggest challenges. We are taking action to address the underlying causes, tackling poverty, supporting fair wages, supporting families, and improving our physical and social environments. And we are measuring progress and impact of the strategy and developing an evidence base for future plans. So I would like to thank everyone who has learned CPR. If you have not already done so, please get involved. I commend Tom Arthur for having taken the first aid course and uh, his staff too. Um, I remember doing a first aid course in this place um, <coughs> with my partner was Annabel Goldie and putting each other in the recovery position was quite interesting. So I think we should all be ready to say let's do it and have the power to save lives in our hands. Thank you very much. President. Thank you. That concludes the debate. I close this meeting.